Hello there. So today on my desk I have an issue 5 Kickstarter 3 board which I am going to be running through tests for the foreseeable and I'm going to show some of the differences or changes between the issue 4 uh, for the Kickstarter 2 and the issue 5 for the Kickstarter 3. So I have the camera pointing nicely at this board. Um, if there are certain things I need to zoom in on a bit, I have a still photo of the board over here. And also I have roughly overlaid the gerbers or gerbers. So we can flick back and forth between the photo, Kickstarter 3, issue 5, and Kickstarter 2, issue 4, to look at some of the differences. And I will just overlay that when I feel the need onto this screen here. So the first change really is if you just look at this PS2 connector here, you see this little green fuse here. So the fuse on the PS2 port uh, has been increased from 350 milliamps to 500 milliamps. The next uses a combo uh, PS2 interface and that can support two devices. Typically it's a mouse and a keyboard. And under the original PS2 specification, this port would have a 500 milliamp fuse because each device is allowed to draw around 275 milliamps. Um, modern keyboards and mice don't draw anywhere near that much, perhaps around 100 milliamps, but people have shown more interest in developing peripherals for the PS2 port. So it made sense to align the fuse on the PS2 port with typically what's around in PC. So yeah, so that is now a 500 milliamp part. So that's that. So the next change, and it's quite a big one, is to VGA RGB. Now, the VGA output has been upgraded from 9-bit color to 24-bit color, and that brings it in line with HDMI. Now, the main reason for that is alternate cores. You may have a core that supports 4096 colors. It can handle that, means that VGA will look as good as HDMI. And also for some of the older cores, um, say the C64 for example, even though it has a small color palette, you may not be able to express those specific colors in 9-bit color. So it would effectively mean that your brown on the C64 may not look exactly the same on the next. And ramping this up to 24-bit color really solves that issue. So we can be color accurate on the 16-bit cores that support 4096 or the 8-bit cores that support far fewer colors. So going from this resistor ladder on the previous iterations to a DAC allows that. And I'm just going to show you now because you can't really see on this camera this bit here. You can't really see the traces on that. And even if I switch to my screenshot over here, um, I'm not really seeing the traces because my photo is not very good. So if I just reveal the Gerber, I've overlaid onto the Gerber. So we can see here the Kickstarter 3, issue 5, and we have these three traces handling the three different channels. Um, this bottom one here obviously is the longest path to get to this DAC, and then this one here has a slight wiggle, and this one here has more wiggle. And that's to ensure that um, all of these traces are exactly the same length so that signals arrive at exactly the same time, which is what you kind of need for good quality analog uh, VGA and RGB. So the original solution, which I'll just bring up here, was a three bits per channel resistor ladder. Um, so it's three bit for each color. And that works reasonably well. You can see here, actually, um, the difference. I'm just going to flick back and forth a bit between issue 5, issue 4. Hold on, sorry. Issue 5, issue 4. So you can see, kind of, it looks a lot neater, actually, doesn't it? And you can also see that the RTC, the RTC is here. This is on the issue uh, 4 here. It's been pushed over slightly to give this uh, room to travel to its uh, DAC. I'm just going back to the uh, board view again. 
So as I, as I mentioned, the um, three-bit resistor ladder DAX for each color, um, it's less accurate. It's inherently noisy, but it's fine at the kind of color depths that we're talking about and the resolution we're talking about. So noise isn't really noticeable um, on that, but it's not suitable for 8-bit color because errors would bleed into the lower bits. So the main issue with introducing 24-bit color for VGA is the sheer number of pins that you would need on the FPGA itself, because KS2 uses nine pins for VGA, and a full 24-bit solution would require 24 pins. And we ain't got 24 pins, they're not available. So instead, each 8-bit channel is time multiplexed over four FPGA pins. So for each color channel, the FPGA outputs the lower four bits of the 8-bit value. These go into a latch where they're held stable. The FPGA then switches those same four pins to carry the upper four bits, and they are fed directly into the DAC here. And what the DAC sees is a complete 8-bit value. Four bits coming directly from the FPGA, and the other four bits coming from the latch. And to do this, the FPGA has to output color data at twice the VGA pixel rate. And the additional setup, propagation time, and hold times through the latch and DAC reduce the minimum, minimum, maximum, sorry, reduce the maximum achievable VGA clock. So in practice, the next runs VGA at about 28 megahertz. And this scheme should comfortably allow clocks in the region of about 55 to 60 megahertz. There's also an alternative mode where VGA runs in 12 bit color. And in that mode, the latch is being bypassed, or these latches are being bypassed entirely, and the upper four bits of each color channel are sent straight to the DAC. That reduces the color depth, but allows the pixel clock to increase a lot, um, potentially approaching 100 megahertz for higher resolutions. So yeah, that's VGA. Let me just switch back to this Gerber view just to see if there's anything else of interest. Probably not. Okay, so the next thing is HDMI back power, part two. This one never seems to go away. So this first appeared in Kickstarter one boards and some HDMI displays were feeding a small amount of power back into the next through the HDMI data lines, even after the board was powered down, which could prevent the FPGA from fully shutting down or resetting cleanly. And in Kickstarter two, it was largely addressed. I can't actually show you here because I've got the pie over it. Um, so Kickstarter 2 added some series capacitors to the HDMI data lines. However, it was later discovered, not long ago actually, that a very small amount of power was still leaking through the HDMI I2C interface. And um, this turned out to be because the I2C pull-ups were connected to the internal 5 volt uh, rail instead of the isolated HDMI 5 volt supply. So how this was picked up was the um, speaker header down here, um, you would see 0 0.8, 0 0.9 volts when 9 volt power had been disconnected and HDMI was still connected. Um, so the current fix is to reroute these um, pull-ups to the decoupled HDMI supply, which eliminates the remaining leakage. Uh, there is a more complex option using a dedicated HDMI power switch device, but this simpler change that's in um, is preferred for now. And I've been measuring um, since I got this uh, Kickstarter 5 board as well. So that 0 0.96 volts I think we were getting is now down to a more comfortable 0 0.23 volts, which isn't enough really to kick an amplifier into line. So it's now below the threshold and should no longer be an issue. So that's HDMI back power, hopefully eliminated for the last time. The next thing is around the expansion bus, and I've still got the tape on this uh, expansion bus. Sorry about this, this is just a flexible thing I use to swap out the uh, Raspberry Pi SD card. So the next primarily targets the 48K and the 128K. That's what it was designed around, the compatibility of those machines. And on the original 48K Spectrum, 
there were four analog video signals and I can't tell you exactly which ones they were. Um, and these analog signals were used for composite and YUV output. And from the 128K onwards, really, those signals were no longer used. I mean, the, the 128 had dedicated RGB and all the machines that came after it had dedicated RGB. So those, those were not presented on here. So they were obsolete. Um, but when the plus two and the plus three came out, Amstrad reused three of these um, unused pins to carry floppy controller signals for the internal disk drive. And in Kickstarter 3, those three signals have been added back to the expansion bus, which matches the plus 2A arrangement. And this will allow external floppy interfaces to be built that support real 3-inch, three 3.5-inch three and 5.25-inch and drives. And this works with plus 3 DOS and the plus 3E ROMs when running in a plus 3 personality. Uh, physical, physical support, though, in Next ZX OS will be introduced, but at some point we're not sure when. So you'll be able to access floppy drives within the next personality itself, which will be grand. Um, I'm hopefully getting a floppy interface uh, in the coming weeks. And I've actually bought a 3-inch uh, Amstrad drive, so I'm going to be doing some tests on that and see if I can get it working. So the next change is less obvious, but important. On the original Spectrum, the expansion bus reset was generated by a simple RC circuit, and that asserted reset briefly during power-up. But that approach doesn't work with FPGA-based systems because an FPGA can reconfigure itself without any kind of power cycle, um, either during a hard reset or when switching to a different core. So in Kickstarter 3, the expansion bus reset is now controlled using the FPGA's done signal. And while the FPGA is reconfiguring, the expansion bus is held in reset. And once configuration completes, the bus remains in reset briefly and then releases cleanly. The same signal is also used to place various expansion bus drivers into a neutral state during reconfiguration. This forms part of the groundwork for better expansion hardware support across alt cores, including identifying which core is active while the bus is held in reset. The next change is that a second SD slot has been added to act as an internal drive. There were two possible locations uh, under the daughter board, which you can't actually see here, and under the main PCB. And under the main PCB was chosen because it's easier for users to access with minimal disassembly, still requires you to uh, take the case apart though, uh, to access it. I don't know if I can show it here, let me just see if I can just get it into, because all wires are plugged in and stuff, so, come on. Huh. Come on. There you go. Just over here. Okay, let's get that back in, sir. Okay, so the hardware automatically determines which SD card to boot from. It'll check the main slot first, followed by this micro SD slot here. Um, so this allows Next ZX OS to live permanently on an internal card. Uh, the main slot can be used for software and games. And the boot order, um, the order in, in terms of which it looks at the SD cards can be overridden um, by holding a key down during power up. I believe you hold down one um, during power up and it will attempt to boot from this one first and then this one. Uh, of course, if it doesn't see a firmware file on one of the SD cards, then it will boot to the one that has the firmware file on. So that's that. The next thing is that the RAM, as you know, has been upgraded from two megabytes to four megabytes. Uh, it's tiny, isn't it? Even the FPGA is tiny. I mean, I always get surprised when I look at the size of these things. Um, but yeah, this is a 4 meg chip here. And if I come back to my uh, screenshot of the next, I can zoom in a bit more. And you can see it's an ISSI. Um, and it's 2048 16-bit, which gives us... Uh, 4 megabytes SRAM, and that 10 shows us that it is 10 nanoseconds. So the increase is intended for alternate cores, not 
for the next. Um, the next itself will continue to target two megabytes so that all software remains compatible with Kickstarter one and two. And uh, we also consider two meg to be a sensible size for the next, given that you also have fast SD storage for on-demand loading. So yeah, that is the four meg. So the final major change is in the FPGA itself. As you know, it's larger. It's a 35T, we'll just zoom in here, on there. And the previous iteration on issue four was a 15T. And those numbers broadly reflect the amount of logic resources available to play with. So the Kickstarter three issue five is just over twice as much resource available. But it's the same package It's a CSG324 package and it is pin compatible. So nothing has to change. It just slots in exactly where the old one was. And one of the motivations around the larger FPGA was cost because the cost difference between the 35 and the 15 was negligible. But also the benefits are alternate cores. Um, think complex 16-bit systems like the Amiga, for example. I'm not saying an Amiga is coming, by the way, but just to say something like that would be comfortable, very comfortable inside a larger FPGA. And additional hardware, you know, could be added to that as well, beyond what the, the Amiga came with. Uh, some 8-bit systems as well may benefit from that, with lots of peripherals being recreated inside this. But there is a commitment that the next hardware will not change. Well, it's hardware in inverted commas, isn't it? But that hardware is going to be available on Kickstarter 1, Kickstarter 2, Kickstarter 3. There's not going to be a break in compatibility or anything like that. The next stays the next. Any additional capacity will be used for quality of life improvements. So one example already is the ability to generate HDMI and VGA output at the same time. Um, this would be possible on KS2 and KS3, but probably won't be possible on KS1. Although with a refactor of KS1, it may be possible to squeeze out a little bit more from it. So that's basically it. Um, I'll just go back to my um, photo here. Let's get rid of that. I'm using Photoshop, as you can probably tell. Um, so I've gone into the VGA, yeah. The slight movement of the RTC. Um, we have some. It's difficult to see really, but if I just click bang up, I can't identify which are the actual paths that have been added um, for the floppy controller. But we also have some Schmidt stuff going on here, um, and some capacitors. So some capacitors here, Schmidt stuff here, which I'm not actually sure what they're doing. They are not there, or there's a little bit up there um, on the issue four that we're looking at now, and here's the issue five. So there are some things, there are some changes, and I don't actually know what they're protecting. Um, obviously not protecting this. Um, so yeah, there are some things I don't know about. But if you do a quick blink comparator between the issue five and the issue four, there's a lot that doesn't, you know, if you ignore the VGA circuit, there's a lot of uh, stuff that's exactly the same. But I guess also we have the uh, soft screen changes on this one as well. Um, we have Sinclair written on the board for the first time, designed in the UK by Ignis Limited. Um, so, yeah, that is issue five. And I have to say thank you to Alan Albright, who provided a lot of the uh, meat for this because I understood some of the changes, but he has a way of wording things far better than I could. So yeah, thanks Alan for that.